years ago I was sitting on a boat while fishing the Missouri River. For the entire trip we watched one barge go up and down the river loading and unloading shot rock along the banks. Shot rock, also known as rip rap. It's placed on the edges of the river to combat river erosion. That evening as I was watching these men working that rock, I saw one man stand on the very front of that barge just a few feet from the edge as it slowly plowed into the current, pushing a wall of water up the river. As the sun faded behind that massive iron beast, I began to think about the river, the history of the river, its pure natural power, unrivaled violence, and the men who died upon it. I recalled a book I had read a year or two prior by a man named Lee Sandlin called Wicked River. It was about the Mississippi River when it last ran wild. I learned about plagues, trapping, pirates, river towns, flat boats, river terminology, and I even learned that President Lincoln was quite the river man himself. At the age of 22, old Honest Abe and his buddies they fell some timber and built a flat boat they took from Illinois to New Orleans one summer. In 1849, Lincoln patented a flotation device that lifted boats over shoals and sandbars after he got a large flatboat stuck on the Mississippi River just a few years before. My mind was wandering. I sat there listening to the low hum of those diesel engines and we watched as the lights began to turn on illuminating the deck from the darkness that was slowly consuming everything within it. The darkness and everything that I could not see made me think about everything I did not know about the Missouri River. And when I got back from my trip, I began to look for stories. This story starts over 200 years ago. The year is 1828, just off the bank of the Ohio River in Louisville, Kentucky. Two friends, Robert Rogers, and Sam Clark were in need of a flatboat. Robert and Sam hear tell of a man in Brownsville, Pennsylvania named John S. Pringle who could build this flatboat for them. After letters, conversations, and design, John brought Robert and Sam's flatboat to life and later delivered it to Louisville. It was there that he traded his time and talent for a bag full of money and went back home to Brownsville. John made so much money building and selling this boat, he built another one, and another one. And build after build, boats got bigger, more complex, and eventually John founded Pringle Boat Building Company. As the business grew and expanded in offering, they planted their flag in the market and became known as one of the finest steamboat manufacturers around. Over time, Nearly 30 years had passed since John sold his first boat to Robert and Sam, and in 1853, Pringle Boat Building Company christened the hull on the brand new Arabia. The Arabia was a massive supply ship that was headed west. It left its home and made its way down the Monongahela River to the confluence at the Ohio River in Pittsburgh. From there, down the Ohio River to the confluence at the Mississippi, up the Mississippi to finally land in its home port of St. Louis, 1100 meandering river miles away from where it was built. It was here that the Arabia found its calling, serving as the supply ship, making runs up and down the unforgiving stretches of the Missouri River to deliver its cargo and deliver its cargo it could. At 171 feet long, it could haul 222 tons of weight and freight such as tools, food, home goods, and guns, just to name a few. With paddle wheels that stood two stories tall and two gigantic smokestacks that proudly stood over three stories off the waterline, the Arabia was indeed one of the finest steamboats in service. Being steam powered, it requires a lot of pressure. Pressures generated through steam, steams generated through heating up a tank of water, and a tank of water was heated 
by burning firewood inside of a giant metal box located next to the boiler. When we think of fuel today, we think of liquid. But the Arabia's fuel was gathered with saw and sweat. The same amount of firewood that one 1,500 square foot home needs to stay warm through the entire winter was what the Arabia would burn from sunup to sundown. One to three cords of wood needed cut, split, stacked, and burned every day to power the steam engine, enough to move five miles per hour on a violent and unpredictable river. September 5th, 1856. It was a cool fall day, business as usual on the Arabia. Every man at his post passing the time with a pocket knife or pipe while the pistons were pumping, keeping perfect rhythm with the river. When all of a sudden it took a devastating blow to the hull from a snag right underneath the water's surface, and within moments, it sank. All 150 passengers bailed off the boat and miraculously lived, but there was one casualty, a mule that was tied up. The Missouri River extinguished the Arabia's heartbeat that day. The wheels stopped turning and the fires stopped burning. All 220 tons of cargo were eventually entombed underneath the river in the Arabia's grave. Underneath the river, you ask? Yes, here's how this works. Have you ever been to the beach, stood ankle deep in the waves and your feet continue to sink until the water is up to your knees and the sand is higher than your shins while your legs continually sink into the earth? Well, that is how it works when something sinks in the river. It doesn't just settle to the bottom of the river and stop. It sinks through the bottom of the river and ends up underground where not even the sound of the water can be heard. Now let's fast forward 132 years. It's the winter time. 1988. Local AC and furnace repair company owner, Bob Hawley, and his sons, David and Greg. They learn of the Arabia story and they get curious and they start looking. They finally discovered the boat's location. Years of erosion and shifting sand left the sunken paddle boat 45 feet underground and a half a mile away from the present channel of the Missouri River. Some of you may ask, how on earth was the steamboat a half a mile away from the river channel? Well, do you remember earlier when I was talking about those men and that barge that I was watching, loading and unloading shot rock or riprap along the banks? You see, if the banks are not lined with rock and man does nothing to intervene, years of currents, harsh weather, and water levels will erode the banks, move the dirt, and ultimately change the shape and location of the river channel. And that is exactly what had happened. Well, Bob and his sons get to work. They partner with a longtime friend, Jerry Mackey, as well as another man named David Luttrell, and they decide to pursue this adventure together. One day they showed up with machines and they began to dig. And together, these five men set out to recover the long lost Arabia. The four and a half month excavation resulted in the discovery of the largest collection of pre-Civil War artifacts in the world. Beautiful glass bottles illustrate the care that was taken in producing containers for ordinary contents such as liquor or ketchup. Small mouth bottles contain preserved fruits for pies as well as bright green sweet pickles. They were still edible. These along with buttons, beads, clothing, 
tools, weaponry, and all of this was found aboard the sunken ship. These treasures are now housed at the Arabia Steamboat Museum in Kansas City's River Market. It's a collection that reveals details of frontier life seen nowhere else. A visit to the museum is a glimpse into the past. The contents of the Arabia's cargo can fascinate a visitor for hours. Case after case, window after window, the world during 1856 comes to life in the everyday items that were recovered on the Arabia. <laughs>